Welcome to Grace Abounds. I'm Pastor Jen Shaw, and in this podcast, I'm sharing my Sunday sermons from St. John's Lutheran Church, Palm Desert, California. I'm so grateful that you've joined us, and I trust that these words build you up in faith, hope, and love. It warmed my heart a few months back when one of the parents in our church shared that her daughter had to write an essay for school on her favorite quote. And she chose that thing Pastor Jen says all the time. I know. I know. (laughs) That thing Pastor Jen says all the time being everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. I first saw that quote years ago on a greeting card as I was browsing through Roman's bookstore in Pasadena. I bought that greeting card and I stuck it on the door of my studio apartment at Fuller Seminary. Because I believe these words express a profound spiritual truth. The truth we celebrate on this beautiful Easter Sunday and every day of the year. The gospel truth we know in Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Everything will be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. This is the reality experienced by the disciples as they accompanied Jesus during the three years of his public ministry. Disciples like Peter. Disciples like Mary Magdalene. The disciples were with Jesus as he demonstrated God's powerful, healing, life-giving love, turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana, feeding thousands on a hillside with five loaves of bread and two fish, walking on stormy waters to join his terrified disciples in their boat with the assurance, it is I, do not be afraid, as he brings them safely to shore. Do not be afraid. The most frequent command in the Bible, given some 365 times in Scripture, one for every day of the year. The disciples were with Jesus as he declared, I am the light of the world, illuminating who our good and gracious Lord is and who we are as the Lord's beloved children. As he declared, I am the way and the truth and the life, revealing in his words and actions what is real and authentic and life-giving. As Jesus declared, I am the good shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep. And the sheep hear my voice and follow me. The disciples were with Jesus as he taught them about life and showed them how to live in relationship with God and each other every day and gave them a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. The disciples experienced Jesus Christ, the God of all creation in the flesh, God with us and for us now and always, God who loves us so much that he joined with us in the fullness of our humanity so that we may join with him in the fullness of his glory. God, our creator, who made everything very good in the beginning what Franciscan theologian Richard Rohr calls original blessing, and who will, in the fullness of time, make everything very good again. Everything will be okay in the end, even when it's not okay. Imagine you are Peter, that Thursday night in the Garden of Gethsemane, watching as Jesus his friend and mentor, the one he believed would save him and his people from oppression, the one he called Lord, was betrayed and arrested, taken away by armed soldiers in the middle of the night, and then following behind at a distance, 
denying three times that he even knew Jesus, turning his back on Jesus and leaving in bitter tears. What did Peter feel when he heard Jesus was dead? Imagine you are Mary Magdalene that Friday at the crucifixion, watching as Jesus, the one who set her free, the most loving, courageous, wisest person she knows, the one to whom she had devoted her life, was brought before an angry mob who called for his death. She saw him beaten and bloodied and mocked. She saw him nailed to a cross. She saw him die. And she saw where his body was laid in haste and without ceremony, not even properly prepared for burial because the Sabbath was coming when no work could be done. And so early on the morning after the Sabbath, early on Sunday morning, while it's still dark, as soon as she can, Mary goes to the tomb to properly prepare his body and mourn his loss. In her love and devotion to Jesus, a woman walking in the dark through a graveyard in fearful and violent times. And when Mary gets to the tomb, she finds that it's empty. The stone has been rolled away. And either those who had had him killed or grave robbers or the gardener or someone else has taken his body and she doesn't know where and she can't even mourn properly. And so she runs to get help, runs to those who are closest to Jesus, goes and tells Peter and the beloved disciple that the Lord is no longer in the tomb. And they all run back and they find the tomb empty. They see only the grave clothes of Jesus lying there, neatly folded and placed, indicating that this wasn't a grave robbery. This wasn't a hasty act. This was the calm and confident work of someone leaving grave clothes behind. Peter doesn't quite get this yet. The beloved disciple believes, but he also doesn't yet fully understand. And the two of them leave. And Mary is left there, standing outside the empty tomb. Not even the appearance of two angels takes away her tears. She doesn't understand. Her heart is broken. She feels alone, weeping in the dark. Everything was not okay. But it was not the end. Imagine you are Mary Magdalene seeing Jesus alive. Though at first, she doesn't recognize him. Perhaps because of her tears. Perhaps because of her grief. Perhaps because she is so focused on Jesus missing from the tomb that she doesn't see Jesus standing right there beside her. At first, in this garden tomb, she supposes that he is the gardener. Someone who tends to creation, who helps things grow, who fosters life. At first, Mary doesn't realize that the very one asking her, whom are you seeking, is the one she seeks. That the question, why are you weeping, is rhetorical. For there is no longer reason to weep. That the one she wants to take with her is already there. And then he says her name, Mary. Everything changes. She hears the voice of her good shepherd. He knows her, and she knows him, her teacher, the one who set her free, the most loving, courageous, wisest person she knows, the one to whom she has devoted her life, is alive, is standing right there beside her, is calling her name. Imagine her joy. She embraces him and wants to hold him tight. But she can't keep Jesus all to herself. She needs to share him. And so Jesus commissions her to go and tell their friends 
that he is risen indeed. He is alive. He is ascending to God the Father. This is perhaps my favorite moment in all of Scripture. And I chose this passage as the gospel reading at my ordination as a minister of word and sacrament. And in his sermon at my ordination, Bishop Murray Fink said that this was, in a way, Mary's ordination to preach the gospel. And Mary does. She goes and tells the other disciples, I have seen the Lord. She shares her experience of Jesus with them. She is the first to proclaim the resurrection, the first to speak the gospel message. Mary Magdalene is the apostle to the apostles. Imagine you are Peter hearing this news. And then later that night, being in a room behind locked doors with the other disciples, when Jesus suddenly appears and says to the disciples who had deserted him, peace be with you, and breathes into them the Holy Spirit and sends them out into the world as God the Father sent him, in love, in peace, in life. What did Peter feel when he saw Jesus alive? And then after spending 40 days with his disciples, as Jesus said he would do, he ascended into heaven. He went home to God the Father and is preparing a place for us there. And one day, he will come again and make all things new, make all things whole, make all things well. In his suffering, death, and resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ suffered along with us so that we know we never suffer alone in this world broken by human sin. Took our death on the cross as his own and freed us from it forever. Rose again to life, bringing us with him into life eternal and abundant, life now and forever, life that does not end. And while our experience of Jesus Christ is different, and Mary Magdalene and Peter and those first disciples on that first Easter morn, Christ is with us right here, right now. In the Holy Spirit, the divine breath of life who fills and sustains us, in whom we live and move and have our being, who speaks to our hearts and minds in the quiet moments of life. Christ is with us in his words, through which he continues to teach us, in his example, through which he continues to inspire us, in the bread and wine of communion that are his body and blood given for us, in this beloved community of St. John's, the body of Christ on earth, in each one of us. And so I invite you into an ever fuller relationship with Jesus Christ in prayer, pouring your heart out to the Lord who knows you and loves you completely and listening, really listening for the voice of our Good Shepherd in studying, learning more about reading about the life, the words and actions of Jesus in Scripture. If you haven't read the Gospels before, I suggest starting with the Gospel of Luke. In staying connected with this community of faith, we have so many opportunities here at St. John's for worship and pastoral care and spiritual formation and building relationships and community outreach, so many opportunities to do the good work and share the good news of Jesus. In the words of Martin Luther, the namesake of our Lutheran denomination, God does not need our good works nor our wealth, but our neighbor does. 
I invite you to trust. Everything will be okay in the end, even when it's not okay. When you experience the pain of this broken world, when you don't understand, your heart is broken, and you feel alone, weeping in the dark, you are not alone. You are never alone. Jesus is right there with you, even if you can't see him through your tears. He is there, right beside you, calling your name. And so I invite you in these moments of sorrow and grief and anxiety to take a deep breath. Feel God's arms of love wrapped around you. Remember, when it's not okay, it's not the end. I saw the first Lord of the Rings movie when it first came out in a theater in Simi Valley in December 2001. I have seen all three movies in that trilogy many, many times since, including the extended cuts, which I own. But at that time, <laughs> I hadn't yet read the books by J.R.R. Tolkien on which the films are based, and so I didn't know what comes next in the story. And at a family gathering later that December, I shared with my dad how distraught I was over the death of Gandalf, one of the heroes of the story who sacrifices himself to save his friends. And my dad, who was a Lord of the Rings fan, who had read all the books and who knew what happens later in the story, said to me with a knowing twinkle in his eye, just wait till the next movie, you'll see. My dad, a man of faith who went home to the Lord in 2019, knows the gospel truth that death is not the end of the story. Christ arose and so will we. Christ lives and so do we. In Christ, we have life now and we have life forever. In Christ, everything will be okay in the end. Amen. Thanks for listening. Each week's episode is edited by Nick Cox. Music performed by our St. John's Worship Band. Sermons by me. Pastor Jen Shaw. Make sure to subscribe to hear each week's message. If you'd like to know more about St. John's mission to know Christ and make Christ known, to share the life-giving word and do the life-giving work of Jesus, visit our website, stjohnslutheran.church. May God bless you on this day and in all the days ahead.